morning. The uh, technology seems to, be, uh, seems to be dominating our class here. So I want to um, come back to the discussion of synthetic organic chemistry and chapter 7. And we're going to spend some time focusing on carbonyl chemistry. Uh, I want to continue what we began with, with aldol reactions, and go to Michael addition and Claisen condensation, in part because carbonyl chemistry really is a mainstay of classical synthetic organic chemistry, and in part because it's so powerful, gives us so many options for carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, and in part because the thinking tools of retrosynthetic analysis works so well with the carbonyl group. In other words, if you can master carbonyl chemistry, we're only spending, what, a week, uh, two and a half weeks on sort of synthetic organic chemistry if you count functional group transformations, three, three and a half weeks on it. So not that long. So a limited subset of reactions and of concepts gives us tremendous power for building up carbon-carbon bonds and building up molecular structures. Well, probably, maybe I'm thinking right now, I might want to spend a little time at the end talking about organometallic chemistry. But right now, in the following lecture, we're going to basically focus on aspects of carbonyl chemistry. So I want to dive in with the Claisen condensation. And a lot of what I'm showing you now are things that you've seen in sophomore organic chemistry and reactions that you've seen. And what you're going to do with the homework is get better and better at putting these reactions together. So the Claisen condensation is very much like the aldol reaction. Same basic idea. It is the addition of and the formation and addition of an enolate. In this case, instead of the addition of an enolate, to an aldehyde or ketone, we're talking about the addition of an enolate to an ester. And the big implication there is that when your tetrahedral intermediate breaks down, you get a 1,3-dicarbonyl compound. And the driving force in the Claisen condensation is that that 1,3-dicarbonyl compound is enolizable, and you can generate the enolate. It's relatively acidic. You can generate the enolate, and that drives the reaction. Let me show you what I mean. So the classic sort of Claisen condensation would be you take, say, an ester like, um, like ethyl acetate. You cook it up with a base, and that base better darn well be, be an ethoxide base, not hydroxide, or you're just going to hydrolyze your ester. So if you're using an ethyl ester, use sodium ethoxide and ethanol. If you're using a methyl ester, use sodium methoxide and methanol. Carry out an aqueous workup, and you get a 1,3-dicarbonyl compound. So the sort of simplest example is self-condensation of ethyl acetate to generate ethyl acetoacetate. And you should have the skills now, in terms of curved arrows, to think your way through the mechanism of this reaction. I'm going to write in sort of a shorthand, abbreviated form, just to help keep us on track. All of the steps are equilibria. And your final step, your final deprotonation of the 1,3-dicarbonyl product drives the reaction. So remember I was talking about pKa before, and I was saying pKa is a unifying theme that I like to take through all carbonyl chemistry. And basically, the notion that if you can have something within, say, about 10 pKa units of each other, you can access an equilibrium. In other words, obviously, when you talk about LDA, 10 pKa units stronger, no problem. You just drive the reaction to completion. But if you have an ethoxide base, an alkoxide base, right, and the pK of ethanol is about 16, and you have an ester, you are on the, which is pK 25, you are on the very, very cusp of generating an equilibrium concentration of enolate. 
In other words, your equilibrium concentration of enolate is going to be about one part in 10 to the ninth because of that nine pKa unit difference. Nevertheless, you can generate a little bit of enolate, and the reaction goes and goes and goes. You generate enolate, it gets consumed. You generate more enolate, it gets consumed, and eventually the reaction goes to completion. So I'll give you a few curved arrows here, but certainly not a thorough mechanism. You attack the carbonyl, you form a tetrahedral intermediate. All of this should be familiar to you by this point. You form a tetrahedral intermediate. Your tetrahedral intermediate can break down, losing ethoxide. And in a way, you would say, oh, we're done now. But we're really not done right now. What is essential in the Claisen reaction is that this reaction, because these are all equilibrating steps, what's essential in the Claisen condensation is that this final step gets driven by the relatively big pKa unit, pKa difference of ethoxide in the 1,3-dicarbonyl. In other words, the 1,3-dicarbonyl pKa of about 10 to the, uh, uh, of, of about 11, ethanol, conjugate base of ethoxide, pKa about, about 16. So you have this final equilibrium step, 10 to the fifth to the right, driving the reaction forming the corresponding enolate. And then on workup, in a separate step, you have to add aqueous acid, and that drives the reaction. And in fact, the need for this is so essential that if I go ahead and take the need to have that final deprotonation is so essential that if I take an ostensibly analogous substrate. In other words, instead of taking ethyl acetate, I take ethyl isobutyrate and subject it to the same conditions, sodium ethoxide in ethanol. We do not end up getting the Claisen condensation product. So I'm going to draw a big X here. In fact, if we were to, uh, to form this product by some way, and we were to subject this to sodium ethoxide in ethanol, we would get reverse Claisen condensation or retroclasin to give us two equivalents of the corresponding ethyl ester. Now, there are various tricks by which one can make chemistry occur like this. Various other leaving groups, cyano groups, and so forth. In general, this is sort of specialized knowledge. You might say, oh, well, what about an acid chloride? That should go. Now, in fact, an acid chloride is going to go primarily on the oxygen of an enolate. So if I generate an enolate and add it to an acid chloride, most of the reaction is going to give us not a Claisen product, not a 1,3-dicarbonyl, but rather an acyl vinyl, uh, vinyl enol ether. All right, anyway, that's what I wanted to say about the Claisen condensation. And I'm going to show you all these reactions backward in just a moment to help us start thinking about retrosynthetic analysis and putting all of these reactions together. But I want to talk about one more reaction first, and that is the Michael addition.
So the Michael addition in general is the addition of a nucleophile to a beta position on an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. So if I draw some generic alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, we've already talked about the carbonyl group. I said when you think about the carbonyl group, you should think about it as a carbon electrophile. In other words, in my mind when I see a carbonyl group is, oh yeah, there's a partial positive charge. I can think of this carbon as being reactive at, with a nucleophile. Now, the beta position of a carbonyl compound, both here and here, you can think of as, as being having the potential to be nucleophilic. And again, I'm drawing all of these positive and negative signs in quotation marks to illustrate not the charge that's there, but this hidden potential in the molecule. In other words, you can carry out reactions that make this position, or for that matter, this position act as a nucleophile. But by way of resonance, the beta position of an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound is also electrophilic. And so a nucleophile, I'll just draw this as Nu minus, a nucleophile has the potential to attack not only at the carbonyl group, but also at the beta position. And if you get attack at the beta position, now you've gone and formed a bond there. And so this sets us up for carbon-carbon bond forming chemistry. One sort of nucleophile that your textbook reminds you of that is particularly good at reacting at beta positions are organocuprate reagents, one of the more primitive organometallic reagents beyond Grignard and organolithium reagents. So if one takes, say, di lithium dimethyl cuprate, Me2Culi, and then does an aqueous workup, we add in a methyl nucleophile at the beta position. The discovery of cuprates having the ability to add at the beta position of alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds was a powerful discovery. Synthetic organic chemistry is about control. It is about being able to build the bonds that you want, where you want them, ideally with the right stereochemistry, and be able to do so efficiently. The development of reagents as tools to be able to do this control is a big area of synthetic organic chemistry. The development of reaction conditions is a big area of synthetic organic chemistry. And often by modulating reaction conditions, one can carry out reactions and get control. Remember I mentioned that carbonyl ca chemistry is a mainstay of synthetic organic chemistry. You'll also notice that this alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound is in its own right a product of carbonyl chemistry because last time in class on Wednesday, we were able to see that, okay, the aldol reaction with dehydration leads to alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyls. In other words, you see an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl, and in your mind, ding, 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 oh, that compound might have come from an aldol reaction with dehydration. And so very complex molecules can be dissected. All right, so back to this element of control and back to this element of the Michael reaction. If I go ahead and take a, an enolate, another sort of nucleophile, and, I, and by the way, I should add that if I just carried out this reaction with methyl lithium, we'd be getting addition to the carbonyl, not to the double bond. So again, there's that element of control there. All right, so back to, back to carbonyl. So ester enolate's one of my favorite nucleophiles. You go ahead, you take an ester enolate. We go ahead, I love to generate ester enolates with LDA and THF. 
at negative 78 degrees. And now, if we add this same electrophile, this cyclohexenone electrophile, and I'll draw it under the arrow. It's a little bit small for those of you in back. That's just cyclohexenone that I've drawn over here. And if we carry out an aqueous workup with H3O plus aqueous acid, and we do this and let the reaction go at 25 degrees Celsius. So in other words, a typical procedure would be in the first step, add my, add my ethyl, uh, what did I use, methyl, methyl isobutyrate to LDA and THF at negative 78. Let the reaction mixture stir for, for say, 30 minutes at negative 78 degrees. Add cyclohexenone, let the reaction mixture warm up to 25 degrees Celsius. The main product of this reaction then would be addition at the beta position. It would be the Michael addition. There is this element of control here, right? You should all be able to think your way through this. You generate the enolate with LDA. The enolate attacks at the beta position. That kicks in. You get a new enolate. That new enolate, now when you carry out your aqueous workup, gets protonated. If we carried out this reaction at negative 78 degrees, the primary product of reaction is the 1-2 addition. In other words, the 1-4 addition, the Michael addition, is a thermodynamic product. The 1-2 addition is a kinetic product. In other words, we can control this reaction to either give us a Michael product or an aldol product. Yeah? Pardon? Negative seven. So then I warm to 25. So yeah, typically, operationally, what one would do would be you would take a flask. Typically, you make your own LDA, so you'd take a flask put in an ice bath, shoot in some THF, shoot in some diisopropylamine, actually probably then chill it in an ice bath, add your butyl lithium, let it stir at negative, uh, at zero degrees for about 15 minutes. That generates your LDA. Typically, you use about 1.05 equivalents of butyl lithium and about 1.1 equivalents of diisopropylamine. Chill that down in a dry ice bath to negative 78 degrees. Drip in your, uh, ethyl, your methyl isobutyrate, let that stir for 30, 30 minutes at negative 78. Drip in your cyclohexenone and allow the ice, dry ice bath to warm up slowly to room temperature. So the Claisen condensation basically needs that equilibrium to drive it. If I generate a enolate, so let's say I generate this enolate here, or, or let's say ethyl acetate, and then add, let's say, another equivalent of ethyl acetate to that LDA, so I'm saying generate with LDA, one doesn't get very efficient reaction. You really, the Claisen condensation is sort of sluggish and doesn't go well. In general, lithium enolates don't do well in that type of chemistry. In general, you need sodium enolates. And in general, because your product is that 1,3-dicarbonyl compound, it's acidic, you're running under equilibrating conditions. So, so basically, yeah, you really pretty much can't, can't do it. There, and again, reagents or tool development Methyl cyanoformate, for example, is one reagent that's been developed for exactly that type of chemistry for adding on a carbomethoxy group.
So even though cyanide is a carbon, carbon bond, it's also a leaving group. PK of the conjugate acid is, I think, about five, if I remember correctly. Um, five? HCN? Five? I think it's five. Anyway, way better than methoxide, PK of methanol, uh, about, you know, about uh, 16. And so here, if I go, went ahead and said, generated my, I'll just use, it would be sort of a lame example, but if I went ahead and generated my lithium enolate of, let's say, ethyl acetate with LDA, added in methyl cyanoformate, carried out a workup, that reaction pretty much can go like that. But that's sort of the exception on the Claisen rather than the rule. The cyano group versus chloride here makes this a more carbon-oriented electrophile, a more what's called soft electrophile, so it tends to go on what's called Ca acylation, whereas if I use the acid chloride here, also a good leaving group, that tends to go on oxygen, go for O acylation. So probably more information than you wanted to know, but if we had, if we had more chance to delve in, or if you take this into the lab or in your graduate studies, in your current research or graduate studies, these are some of the thoughts and decisions you'd be making. Other thoughts and questions? These are good. These are really important. All right. So embedded in all of this carbonyl chemistry are that we are generating carbonyl compounds where there are relationships with carbonyls and other functional groups. And so the aldol reaction, the Michael addition, the Claisen reaction, when we're talking about chemistry of carbonyls with carbonyls, you get clues in the molecule for how they're put together. And of course, those clues allow us to carry out what's called retrosynthetic analysis. in order to help dissect and think about how molecules are formed. Retrosynthetic analysis is often credited to E.J. Corey for thinking about molecular assembly, although I think a lot of people have used this, this skill. But it is basically this idea of being able to go ahead and look at a molecule. So here was one of the aldol examples I had given earlier, one that, mind you, we use in our Chem 160 class, to be able to use the skill of saying, oh, here are two functional groups. They have a relationship to each other. This molecule is a beta hydroxy carbonyl compound. A beta hydroxy carbonyl compound can be formed by an aldol reaction in which we form the bond between the alpha and the beta carbon. And I'll just draw, maybe I'll draw a little, little squiggly line through here just to indicate that in my mind's eye in thinking backwards, I'm thinking about breaking that bond, and you can say, oh yeah, all right, that molecule can come from benzophenone and tert-butyl acetate. So last time we also talked about the aldol reaction with dehydration. And as an example, I gave this product. And again, looking at this product, we say, oh, this is an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. <laughs> 
alpha beta unsaturated compound, carbonyl compounds, can be formed by way of an aldol reaction with dehydration. I'll just write that as aldol reaction, in which we form, again, the bond between the alpha and beta carbons. But now, under the reaction conditions, which in the forward sense here was cooking up the reaction mixture with sodium hydroxide, under the reaction conditions of base and heat, we get not just the formation of the beta hydroxy carbonyl, but also the elimination of water. And so this reaction can come from the self-condensation of two molecules of butyraldehyde. Could you also form a different product between those two compounds, those two in the aldo reaction? Here. So, Couple of comments on this. So you say a different product. So this is an example of what's sometimes referred to as a crossed aldol. And in the case of an LDA aldol, what I love about our LDA chemistry is this element of control. You are picking your base so that you go ahead generate one enolate. You generate it stoichiometrically, and then that enolate reacts in the next step. You add the carbonyl compound. So you have this element of control. Now in this particular example, I used a non-enolizable ketone, but I could have used an enolizable ketone. I could have used an aldehyde for this component. For this component here, I could have used another ketone. And so here we're having sometimes what you would call a directed aldol, where the LDA is providing a direction. But last time we looked at a classical crossed aldol. And the example I gave, I think, was probably benzophenone and benzaldehyde. And in the classical crossed aldol reaction, you get your, you avoid the possibility, right? If I took benzophenone plus propiophenone here, and let's say I cook these two up with sodium hydroxide or sodium ethoxide, probably I use sodium hydroxide and ethanol you would get a mess where you would get this enolate from the propiophenone condensing with the acetophenone. You would get the propiophenone condensing with itself. You would get the acetophenone condensing with the propiophenone and the acetophenone condensing with itself. Four different types of combinations. But in the classical crossed aldol, where you have an enolizable ketone and a non-enolizable aldol, aldol, aldehyde, here you cook this up with, say, sodium hydroxide and ethanol, and you get a single product. And of course, that then begs the question, well, how do we control and get some other product? So how do you control the yield? I know that there's like multiple, aren't there multiple like product, like it could form like, it could, it could like form product within itself and everything. So meaning, meaning the, even under these conditions, the acetophenone could condense with itself. Well, the nice thing is, okay, so you generate, the only enolate you can form under these equilibrating conditions is acetophenone enolate. But now the acetophenone enolate, you generate an equilibrium concentration of it, right? pK of a ketone, about 20 pKa of uh, hydroxide or ethoxide, about 16 uh, for the corresponding conjugate acid. But now you've got an aldehyde competing with a ketone as an electrophile. The aldehyde is massively better as an electrophile. So coming down to yield on, say, this reaction here, old-fashioned aldol condensation, I would expect the yield of this reaction to be probably about 60%. 
yield of this reaction, maybe 80%, 70% would be my guess with isolation of product. Based on personal experience, and we use this directed aldol in the teaching lab, it's, you know, I think 90% yield. You know, it is a very nice, clean reaction to begin with. And that's one of the reasons why I like this type of LDA-directed aldol chemistries. It tends to be pretty clean. You're welcome. Other questions? All right, so let's play with a little more retrosynthetic analysis. So I said alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound and beta hydroxy carbonyl compound, clue one in for an aldol reaction. If a 1,3 dicarbonyl compound clues one in for a Claisen condensation, and I will just start with what we had seen before. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but here's the product that we saw just a few blackboards ago. Looking at this product, you say, oh, oh, that's a 1,3 dicarbonyl. There are two carbonyls in a close relationship to each other. A 1,3 dicarbonyl compound clues you in for, oh, okay, that might form by a Claisen condensation, in which case we can form the bond between the alpha and the beta position, and we're down to two molecules of ethyl acetate. And just to be complete here, because these are really the classic relationships in the oxygen manifold. We'll see the nitrogen manifold next time. But these are the classical relationships in the oxygen manifold. So just again looking here, again just going back a couple of blackboards and saying, oh, oh, I see a relationship between these two carbonyl groups. They're far apart, but they have a finite relationship. This is a 1,5 dicarbonyl compound. A 1,5 dicarbonyl compound clues us in for a Michael addition. And that allows us to think about breaking the bond between what we'll call the three and four position and going back what did I use? I used the methyl ester, so going back to the methyl ester and the cyclohexenone. Thoughts? All right. What's nice about this skill set is you start to look at molecules and immediately begin ripping them apart with your eyes. And so if I look at this molecule here, this 3-methyl cyclopentene 2-ohm, immediately you're going to say, oh, that's an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl. rip it apart with your eyes in the same way and say, oh, okay, that 
takes me back over to here. And if I redraw that molecule, that's just hexane 2,4-dione. And now if I subject hexane 2,4-dione to our sort of classical condensation conditions of, say, sodium hydroxide in water or sodium ethoxide in ethanol, or even if we're not dealing with esters, sodium hydroxide in ethanol or ethanol water mixtures. And that gets us over here. In other words, an intramolecular aldol. Thoughts? Now, if you're paying attention, one thing you're going to see is these two carbonyls also have a relationship. And those, that relationship isn't a 1,3 dicarbonyl like a clasin or a 1,5 dicarbonyl like a Michael, that is a 1,4 dicarbonyl. And I haven't talked about 1,4 dicarbonyls yet, and I won't in this chapter. They, this concept gets brought in in chapter 8. But if you'll notice, the notion that I gave before of there being a natural polarity plus minus, plus, and if you want to extend it out, you can say minus, ends up now getting thrown into chaos for the synthesis here in that you'd look and you'd say, wait, we don't have any tools in our toolbox yet to put this molecule together because if I want to go ahead and form this bond, I need to form connecting a, shall we say, plus with a plus. If I want to go ahead and form this bond, here I have to connect a minus with a minus. And what you will see in the next chapter is that chemists have developed this concept of umpalung, of inversion of the natural polarity of functional groups to be able to form other sorts of relationships, to make something that is equivalent to a carbonyl act as a nucleophile rather than as an electrophile. But we will get to see that later. All right. I want to continue to play with this idea of retrosynthetic analysis and also use this as an excuse to introduce some intramolecular reactions. So let's take a look at this molecule. So this molecule is also a 1,3 dicarbonyl. And if I'm thinking myself rather clever, I can go ahead and say, OK, I learned about 1,3 dicarbonyls. I could rip this molecule apart by forming a bond between the, the alpha and the beta position. In other words, thinking backwards, I can get myself over to here by way of an intramolecular clasin. And the intramolecular clasin has a special name. It's called the Dieckmann condensation.
And in the forward sense, that means we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 carbon chain, a diest diester of the cor corresponding carboxylic acid. And if we subject this diester to Claisen condensation conditions, sodium ethoxide in ethanol followed by an aqueous workup. we can get over to the corresponding condensation product. Thoughts? Absolutely. Great, great question. So your question is, why am I always matching the ester with the acid uh, or with the alkoxide base? So one of the reactions that's always occurring as well, it's a degenerate reaction in this case, is you are always getting, in addition to enolate formation, you are getting plenty of attack onto the carbonyl by your alkoxide base. And that generates a tetrahedral intermediate. And that tetrahedral intermediate breaks down and in this case it's a degenerate reaction. One ethoxide attacks the carbonyl, and it may, may get exchanged for another, but it's transparent. It doesn't matter. If we were using methoxide, now you would start to get some of the ethoxy product, some of the methoxy product, so we would end up having a mixture of the ethyl ester and the methyl ester. And if we were to use hydroxide or even use ethanol that was wet with water, we would end up with ester hydrolysis because hydroxide ends up going ahead and hydrolyzing or saponifying esters. And just like your Claisen condensation, although all of these reactions are equilibria, your final reaction is game over because now you have an acid that's much stronger reacting with your base that's much stronger, and so that reaction goes one way. In other words, you've got an acid pK of about 5, conjugate base of an acid pK of 16. Irreversibly, you drive this reaction generating the carboxylate. Good question. All right. If, if you have been paying attention you may notice I've just pulled a fast one on you. And here's the fast one I've pulled on you. The 
the fast one that I've pulled on you is I've chosen one of the bonds between an alpha and a beta position. I have conveniently chosen this bond in taking this molecule apart. And you can look at this molecule and say, oh, wait a second, what happened if he chose this bond? And so let's do that. We take this apart in the same way and you get a completely different way of putting together the molecule, also by way of a clason. If we want to get fancy, we can call this a crossed clason, just like we call the aldol a crossed aldol. But the gist of it is very simple. It's that there are two ways to put together this molecule by way of a Claisen condensation. One way that's an intramolecular condensation, and another way that's an intermolecular condensation of an enolizable ketone with a non-enolyzable ester. In this case, it is an ester. Remember when I talked about oxidation state and I said we've got primarily at the top of most functional groups the carboxylic acids, then we've got the ketone aldehyde oxidation state, then the alcohol oxidation state. Below that we have the alkane oxidation state, and I said, well, if we're going to go all the way, you've got methane as sort of a singleton example of an alkane. But more importantly, you've got carbon dioxide at the plus four oxidation state. This is an ester of carbonic acid. In fact, this molecule is called diethyl carbonate. And we could easily go ahead and do a cross clasin condensation with diethyl carbonate and sodium ethoxide and let's say maybe a little bit of ethanol, although we really don't need it. You can use the diethyl carbonate as a solvent, followed by an aqueous workup and a completely different way of putting this molecule together. Yeah? Diethyl carbonate. Yep, just mix it together. So operationally, all of the, so for the LDA, the directed aldols, are special because you're taking control. It's, I'm going to make the enolate, then I'm going to do something with it. All these equilibrating reactions with sodium hydroxide, sodium ethoxide, because you're only generating equilibrium concentration of enolate, you don't have that control. You just throw everything in a pot, cook it up. So in this particular reaction, I would throw my cyclohexanone in a pot, throw in some diethyl carbonate. It's cheap. If I wanted to, I could also do this with some ethanol in that same pot. Let them stir together, probably boil it up, reflux it. After some hours, after TLC says it's done, cook it up and add some water. So, and I will point out one last, one last fast one that I pulled in our retrosynthetic analysis, which you can think about on your own. So coming back to our 1,5-dicarbonyl compound, I went ahead and took this bond, but you could look and say, okay, well, that's a bond between an alpha and a beta position, but there's another bond between an alpha and a beta position over here, and you could go ahead and say, all right, where does that get us? And again, applying your now growing skill set in retrosynthetic analysis, 
you could say, all right, well, this may not, I'm going to actually, this isn't the, the example for it, so I'm going to cheat. I'm going to remove, remove one methyl group here. But you could go ahead and say, oh, wait a second. If we didn't have one more group at that position, I could go ahead and now find a whole different conjugate addition where I'm doing an intramolecular Michael. And this is one of the things that I love about synthetic organic chemistry is there is so much freedom to be thinking about molecular structure and how to put it together. So we'll pick up next time talking about some acid catalyzed aldol reactions and the nitrogen analogs. I will see you on Wednesday.